Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go. A few months ago, I was just another face in the crowd struggling to make ends meet in a big city. I had a decent job, an apartment, and what I thought was a solid group of friends. But things started to unravel faster than I could have imagined. First, the company I worked for went under. No warning, no severance. Just a sorry or close enough the shop email on a Friday afternoon. Then, as if that wasn't enough, my roommate decided to move out without any notice, leaving me with a rent I couldn't afford on my own. I tried to keep my head above water, but it wasn't long before I found myself on the streets, homeless, jobless, and feeling utterly lost. I've never been one for drinking or drugs, always felt like they caused more problems than they solved. So instead of drowning my sorrows, I decided to hit the road and look for opportunities elsewhere. That's how I ended up here, at this little marina way up north. The owner took a chance on me, offering me a job and a small room to stay in. It's not much, but it's a fresh start. I run the storefront, renting out boats and cottages, selling fishing gear and snacks. And yeah, we sell beer too. Which brings me to what happened today. I was behind the counter organizing some tackle boxes when this young guy walks in. He couldn't have been more than 18 trying to act all grown up as he plopped a 24 pack of beer on the counter. Can I see some ID please? What? Come on man, I'm 20, just ring it up. Sorry, but I need to see some ID. No ID, no sale. That's the law. The guy scuffing. Are you serious right now? I told you I'm old enough. Don't make me go get it. My car's right outside and I'm in a hurry. So you're driving without a license? The guy's face turned red. And he stormed out without another word. I thought that would be the end of it, but boy was I wrong. About half an hour later, this woman walks in. She's probably in her 40s with that I want to speak to your manager haircut. I spot the same guy from earlier waiting in a car outside. The woman grabs another 24 pack and marches up to the counter. She points outside and narrows her eyes at me. Are you the one who wouldn't sell my baby his beer earlier? Yes, ma'am. No ID, no sale. That's our policy. The woman huffing. Whatever. She tries to push the beer towards me to ring up. I hesitate. Does your son have his ID now? No, he doesn't. I am buying the beer. I'm sorry, but I can't sell it to you if I know it's for someone who couldn't provide ID earlier. The woman, voice rising. Excuse me? I'm in my 40s. I have my license right here. I understand, ma'am, but I know this isn't for you. It's for the young man outside who could improve his of legal age. The woman, now yelling, You absolute moron. How dare you refuse to serve me? I'm going to call corporate and have you fired. Ma'am, this is a small business, but I'll be happy to give you the owner's number if you'd like to speak with them. The woman, screaming at this point, You haven't heard the last of this. She storms out, flipping me off as she goes. I watch as she gets into the car with a young guy, both of them glaring at me as they speed away. As soon as they are gone, I grab the phone and call the owner. I explain everything that happened, my heart still racing a bit. The owner laughing, he handled that perfectly. Good job standing your ground. Thanks. I was worried for a second there. No need to worry. You did exactly what you're supposed to do. Keep it up. It's not always easy doing the right thing, especially when people get in your face about it. But I've learned that standing up for what's right even in small ways can make a difference. As I go back to organizing the tackle boxes, I can't help but chuckle to myself. Who would have thought that a guy who was homeless just a few months ago would end up being the responsible one? Following the rules and standing up to entitled customers. Life sure has a funny way of working out sometimes. I don't know what tomorrow will bring, but for now I'm just grateful to have a job, a roof over my head, and the satisfaction of knowing I'm doing my best to do the right thing. When I moved into this neighborhood five years ago with my daughter, we were looking for a fresh start after my divorce, and this place seemed perfect. The houses were nice and the streets were clean and the community seemed friendly. Little did I know what I was getting myself into. From day one, I noticed how obsessed some of my neighbors were with decorations. Every holiday, the whole street would transform into a festive wonderland. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy a good celebration as much as the next person, but these folks took it to another level. At first, I tried to keep up, 
uh, put up a few pumpkins for Halloween, some lights for Christmas, and maybe a wreath for Easter. But as time went on, I realized how much time, money, and effort it all took. Between work, taking care of my daughter, and trying to maintain some semblance of a social life, I just couldn't keep up with the Joneses anymore. That's when the trouble started. Our neighborhood had a homeowners association, and they took their job very seriously. The president of the association was this woman everyone called Karen. She was the type who'd measure your grass with a ruler to make sure it wasn't a millimeter too tall. Last Halloween, things really came to a head. I was swamped with work and my daughter had been going through a tough time at school. Decorating for Halloween was the last thing on my mind, but Karen wouldn't have it. The day before Halloween, she showed up at my door. What's going on here? Where are your decorations? Oh, hi. I've been really busy this year. I don't think I'll be decorating. <laughs> Excuse me? That's not acceptable. It's in the Homeowners Association rules that all houses must participate in holiday decorations. I'm pretty sure that's not a real rule. Well, it should be. You're ruining the neighborhood atheistic. Think of the children. I tried to reason with her, but she wouldn't listen. She stormed off, promising there would be retaliation. The next day, Halloween itself, I came home from work to find my front yard full of the tackiest, most garish decorations I'd ever seen. Inflatable ghosts, plastic, tombstones, fake, cobwebs everywhere. And right in the middle of it all was Karen, looking smug. There. Now your house fits in with the rest of the neighborhood. What the hell? You can't just put decorations on my property without my permission. Well, you weren't going to do it yourself. I'm just enforcing neighborhood standards. I was furious. But before I could say anything else, I heard a scream from inside the house. It was my daughter. She'd come home from school and seen all the decorations. Now, my daughter has always been a bit sensitive. And she'd been having a hard time lately. Seeing our house suddenly transformed into a horror show without warning really freaked her out. I rushed inside to comfort her, leaving Karen standing in the yard, and it took me hours to calm my daughter down. By the time I got back outside, Karen was gone, but the decorations remained. That incident really shook both of us up. My daughter had nightmares for weeks, and I was left with a giant mess to clean up. I tried to file a complaint with the homeowners association, but guess who was in charge of handling complaints? That's right, Karen. From that point on, it was like I had a target on my back. Karen started finding every little thing to find me for. My mailbox was the wrong shade of beige, my hedges were an inch too tall, and I got a fine for having my trash cans visible from the street for more than 24 hours after pickup. I tried to fight it all at first, but it was exhausting. I had a full-time job and a daughter to take care of. I didn't have time or energy for Karen's pity tyranny. So I started ignoring the fines. I figured if I just kept my head down, eventually she'd get bored and move on to harassing someone else. As the fines piled up, Karen's harassment got worse. She'd show up at my door at all hours demanding payment. She'd leave nasty notes on my car, and she even started telling the other neighbors that I was a troublemaker who was bringing down property values. It all came to a head this Halloween. I'd made it clear months in advance that I wouldn't be decorating. My daughter and I were planning to visit my parents for the holiday to avoid any repeat of last year's trauma. I thought I covered all my bases. The day before we were set to leave, I was in the backyard doing some last-minute yard work when I heard the most ungodly noise. It sounded like a freight train was barreling through our quiet little cul-de-sac. I ran out front to see what was going on, and I couldn't believe my eyes. There, in the middle of the street, was a full-sized wrecking ball. And who was at the controls? Karen, with a manic gleam in her eye. This is your last chance. Pay your fines and put up your decorations or I start swinging. Are you insane? Where did you even get that thing? My cousin works in demolition. He was happy to help teach a lesson to a neighborhood troublemaker. I was speechless. This woman had completely lost her mind. I pulled out my phone and started recording, hoping to get evidence of her threats. That's when she really went off the deep end. Oh, you want to play hardball? Fine. And then she actually did it. She had her cousin, who was with her, show her how to swing that wrecking ball right at my house. It smashed into my front porch, sending splinters of wood flying everywhere. I was in shock. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. 
but I know I had to act fast. I dialed 911 as quickly as I could. Hello, police? There is a crazy woman destroying my house with a wrecking ball. The operator tells me I'm sorry, sir. Did you say a wrecking ball? Yes, a literal wrecking ball. Please hurry. While I was on the phone, Karen took another swing. This time, she hit one of the support beams for my roof. I could hear the whole house groan. Are you ready to comply now or should I keep going? Karen, stop. The police are other way. You're going to jail for this. Ha, huh. I'd like to see them try. I'm providing a valuable community service. Thankfully, it didn't take long for the police to arrive. I guess freaking ball rampage gets prioritized pretty high on their response list. As soon as Karen saw the flashing lights, the color drained from her face. She tried to make a run for it, but it turns out freaking balls are in great getaway vehicles. The police were just as baffled as I was by the whole situation. They arrested Karen on the spot, charging her with destruction of property, reckless endangerment, and a whole host of other crimes I can't even remember. Along with her cousin. As they were putting her in the back of the police car, she was still yelling. This isn't over. You'll see. The homeowners association will hear about this. Karen, you just destroyed half my house with a stolen wrecking ball. I don't think the homeowners association is going to be on your side this time. Plus, we later knew that the payment for renting that wrecking ball and the cost of bringing it over was made using the HOA funds. In the aftermath, it turned out Karen had been embezzling from the homeowners association for years. She'd been using the money to fund her over-the-top holiday decorations and to pay people off to look the other way when she harassed residents. Once she was arrested, it all came tumbling down. The repair costs for my house were covered by the homeowners association's insurance and Karen is now serving a nice long sentence in state prison. The new homeowners association board is much more reasonable, thank God. As for me and my daughter, we're doing much better now. The whole ordeal was scary, but it brought us closer together. We still don't go crazy with holiday decorations, but we do put out a pumpkin or two for Halloween. And every time we do, we share a laugh about the year, a wrecking ball nearly took out our front porch. My wife and I met in college, bonding over our shared love of photography and filmmaking. We dreamed of creating content together, maybe even starting a family vlog channel someday. But life had other plans. After graduation, we settled into regular jobs. I became an IT specialist, and she took up teaching at a local elementary school. We got married, bought a house, and had two beautiful kids. Our dreams of content creation took a backseat to the daily grind of raising a family and paying bills. I noticed my wife getting restless lately, spending more time on her phone and giggling at videos. I didn't think much of it, figuring she'd found a new hobby to keep herself entertained, but little did I know what was really going on. When I accidentally picked up her phone thinking it was mine, a notification popped up. Your video has reached 1 million views. Curious, I tapped on it. That's when I discovered her secret TikTok account. At first, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. There were dozens of videos of our kids doing silly things. Our son tripping over his toys, our daughters singing off-key to let it go, and even that embarrassing moment when our boy couldn't find the bathroom in time and had an accident on the carpet. I felt off. Part of me was proud that people found our kids entertaining, but another part felt uncomfortable. These were private family moments being shared with strangers. As I scrolled through the comments, I noticed something odd. People were asking about exclusive content and how to access it. And that's when I stumbled upon her Patreon page. She was selling these videos of our kids to her followers. I was floored. This wasn't just harmless fun anymore. She was profiting from our children's most vulnerable moments. I decided to confront her about it when she got home from work. Hey. We need to talk about something important. What's up? You look serious. I found your TikTok account. The one with videos of our kids. Oh, that? It's just a bit of fun. No big deal. It is a big deal. You're selling videos of our children to strangers. Come on, don't be such a buzzkill. It's harmless. Harmless? Our kids are too young to understand what's happening. They can't consent to this. You're being overdramatic. It's just some silly videos. But you're making money from it. Don't you see how wrong that is? Wrong? I'm finally doing something creative. And you want to ruin it? We could even afford a family vacation with what I'm making. 
A vacation built on exploiting our kids? That's not right. Exploiting? I'm sharing cute moments. People love it. I think we need to take down the account and talk to the kids about privacy. Take it down? Are you crazy? You're just jealous of my success. Jealous? This isn't about me. It's about protecting our children. You don't support me at all. You never have. I was at a loss. How could she not see the problem? I decided to reach out to our friends for advice. Some agreed with me, saying it was wrong to use our kids for views and money, and others thought I was overreacting. When my wife found out I told our friends, she exploded. How dare you tell everyone about my account? You're trying to sabotage me. I'm not sabotaging anything. I'm trying to protect our family. You're ruining everything. This is my chance to do something meaningful. Meaningful? At the expense of our children's privacy? You just don't understand. You never do. She stormed out, slamming the door behind her. I sat there feeling lost and conflicted. And that's when I had an idea. I called my lawyer friend for advice. Hey, I need some legal advice about children's privacy rights on social media. That's a complex area. What's going on? I explained the situation and my friend's response was eye-opening. What she's doing could be considered exploitation of minors. There are laws against using children for commercial purposes without proper permits and safeguards. So, what you're saying is, what she's doing might be illegal, at the very least, it's ethically questionable. Armed with this information, I decided to take action. I documented everything, the videos, the Patreon page, the money she'd made. Then I sat down with my wife one last time. We need to talk. What you're doing isn't just wrong, it might be illegal. What are you talking about? I've spoken to a lawyer. Using our kits for commercial purposes without proper permits is against the law. You're bluffing. I'm not. We have two choices here. Either you take down the account and we figure this out together, or I have to report this to the authorities. You wouldn't dare. I don't want to, but I will if I have to. Our kids come first. She stared at me for a long moment, then burst into tears. I just wanted to do something for myself. I felt so trapped. I understand that, but this is in a way. We can find other ways for you to be creative that don't involve exploiting our children. In the end, she agreed to take down the account. It wasn't easy and we had a lot of work to do to rebuild trust, but it was a start. We decided to use the money she'd made to pay for family therapy to help us all navigate this new world of social media and privacy. I never expected to teach at a summer camp, but after losing my high school photography job, I needed work. The camp seemed like a good fit for my skills. There were five of us teachers, including a recent university graduate I'll call Mr. Know-It-All. From day one, he acted superior to everyone. A few weeks in, another teacher pulled me aside. Mr. Know-It-All's been talking trash about you behind your back. He called you stupid in our last staff meeting. I was shocked. I'd never had issues with him face to face. When I tried to confront him, he'd always make excuses and run off. One day, I overheard him talking to the camp director. I don't think they are cut out for this job. They are always missing meetings and messing things up. I'd had enough and confronted him, but he just stammered excuses. As a camp photographer, I was in charge of the end of camp slideshow. That's when I decided on my revenge. I spent hours editing every photo carefully removing Mr. Now It's All from each one. Sometimes I crop him out entirely, other times leaving just a foot to arm in frame. For the big group photo, I couldn't leave him out completely. Instead, I gave him a digital makeover. Bright red skin, like a bad sunburn, bloodshot eyes, and corn yellow teeth. At the slideshow, I watched Mr. Know It All's confusion as picture after picture flashed by without him. When a grove photo appeared, he gasped and sank in his seat, turned red in real life this time. After the show, one of the other teachers approached me, grinning. Nice work with the photos. I noticed a certain someone was conspicuously absent. Me? Innocently? Oh, I hadn't noticed. The next day, as we were packing up, Mr. Know-It-All approached me nervously. Look, I'm sorry for how I've acted. I was feeling uh, insecure and took it out on you. It wasn't right. Part of me wanted to rub it in, but I decided to take the high road. Apology accepted. Maybe next time try talking to people directly instead of gossiping behind their backs. He nodded sheepishly and walked away. Sometimes a picture really is worth a thousand words, especially 
when someone's not in it. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.